What's up, y'all? Got a little JJK Q&A video for you today. So if you're not caught up through Chapter 269, spoilers beware. And first up today, we got this from Extra Firm Tofu. Incredible name, by the way. But this is less of a question and more just throwing out a possibility for a potential sequel. So y'all can pause to read it. But they're saying that if Yuta and Maki do get together, then perhaps if they have a child, it could technically be the first Limitless 10 Shadows user, considering Yuta's connection to the Gojo clan and obviously Maki's connection to the Ten Shadows, and perhaps a sequel could follow that child's journey as the protagonist as a Limitless Ten Shadows user. And yeah, I mean, I think that's a really cool concept. I would love to see the Limitless paired with other curse techniques and certainly the Ten Shadows, right? And I've said it, um, you know, once, I'll probably say it a few more times before this series ends, but I am all in on a sequel if that's what Gege decides to give us. Um, you know, and because I like JJK, selfishly, I hope there is a sequel. But for now, I'm not seeing that. I mean, we do have two chapters left. A lot could happen in two chapters that would definitely pave the way for a sequel. But, um, you know, as it stands right now, I'm not hedging my bets on that. But yeah, that would certainly be a cool route to take it if so. And yeah, I would love to just have more of these things fleshed out and get more world building in this really cool world that Gege made. Next up, we've got a longer one from Autistic Tomato here, so y'all pause as well, but this entire first half just deals with their reactions to the chapter, saying that the more they think about it, the more they liked the Higuruma stuff, and they touch on the Nanami Higuruma parallel, which I've touched on a little bit in a previous video as well, so I'm right there with you, but they also agree with me in saying that the whole Yuta thing feels really strange, and yeah, 100%. That's why I still fully expect something to develop with the Yuta Gojo situation in these final two chapters, and if it doesn't, I'm going to be really surprised and disappointed, um, but that's why I just feel like, even if it's not much, like, there must be something else coming, and, you know, this could, we could point back to this as being massive cope if nothing happens, but we'll see. And then here is the second part of Tomato's comment. Y'all can pause to read, but it's pretty much just going through their thoughts on the chapter. And I largely agree with basically everything you say here. I'm very curious what's going to be explored in these final two chapters. I too, as I'm sure you know, really enjoyed getting the simple domain lore and world building. So might we get some more type of that information in these final chapters? Will it be more interpersonal characterization type moments? Uh, could we get some more fleshing out on Yuta kind of aside from the Gojo comparison necessary or not comparison but situation necessarily but also the fact that he is Fujiwara and Sugawara right he is maybe even more blessed than Gojo right will something else come of that little tidbit that we were teased with we'll have to see I mean two chapters is potentially like 40 pages when in in a dialogue heavy chapter like 269 that's a lot of room for stuff right so we simultaneously do have room for I think a lot of things to be explored in these final two chapters, but it's really just a matter of what Gege finds important, right? Like, I do not think we are going to get everything touched on. Like, of course we're not, right? So yeah, I'm very curious just to see like what he's going to spend this prime real estate on at the end of this series. Next up, we got this from Emil who says, totally agree on the Higuruma rant. And yeah, guilty as charged. For those of y'all that didn't see, yesterday I put out a 15 minute video rant talking about Higuruma and the fact that he's still alive and defending Gege's writing in that regard. And, uh, you know, I just got to say that at the end of the day, your boy is human as well. I've got a little aggravation meter. And when that gets all the way full from all of these, you know, parroted negative comments from people saying JJK is trash, Gege is an ass writer, like it reaches that limit. I just have to put out a 15 minute rant. It's just my escape. You know what I mean? And I always feel like I have to give this disclaimer. People are welcome to not like things. If you didn't like, you know, the direction JJK has gone, that is completely fine. That's beautiful, in fact. Art is subjective, something I've said many times. People are going to react to it different ways. If it wasn't for you, that's fine. That's expected, right? Uh, where I have an issue is where instead of saying like, yeah, I disliked this. It wasn't really for me. I wish it had gone this way. Instead of like having a constructive conversation like that and explaining why maybe something didn't resonate with you, instead just parroting JJK ass. Gege, terrible writer. That's where I just get frustrated. And you know, when you get a couple hundred comments like that, um, it, it just, I reach the limit and I have to put out the rant. So that's all that was. You guys can, this was just a little teaser of that video if you want to go check it out. But anyways, here's what I love about this. Emil says that he agrees with the Higuruma rant and yet 
269 was one of his least favorite chapters in all of JJK. And this is like the, you know, for lack of a better word here, adult nuanced way to have a critique here. You know, it's not just that, you know, since 269 was my least favorite, so objectively it's ass, you know? No, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I can get what you're saying about those points. I just still didn't like it and beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Emil has clearly touched grass. Next up, we got this from Guy Man, which is also touching on the Higuruma stuff. And don't worry, I'm not going to launch into another diatribe here. But he says that true believers knew Bigaruma was never going to die. And first of all, Bigaruma, I don't know how that never connected for me before. It was it was right there the whole time. So thank you for that. But he says that, yeah, he knew RCT, his slices weren't as bad as the 50% discount. Uh, Guy Man never expected him to be gone. And, you know, I, I touch on that as well in my video. Like, it wasn't ever that Higuruma was six feet underground and then just miraculously came back or anything he also touches on uh, a moment from Higuruma's final moments where he actually is able to look Yuji in the eye and yes I love that detail especially because the reason he was able to do that in my opinion is because he was taking the exit door right he was taking the easy way out and so it's like yep I'm getting what I want here Yuji I'm passing this on to you now so again I love the fact that he wasn't able to just take that easy way out and is going to have to wrestle with his demons and for anybody wondering what i'm talking about go check the 15 minute video we go all into higuruma's characterization next up we got a few questions from solace willow here except they say they had three questions for me and yet i'm only seeing two bullet points here so i'm not sure if you're launching me into an arg where i'm gonna have to hunt down the third question or perhaps you just forgot to include it so let me know if that was the case but to go over this first one here y'all can pause to read the whole thing but he's essentially asking had yuji not really entered the equation with choso do i think he would have found people to feed his other curse womb death painting brothers to in order to let them incarnate the same way Choso had. And yes, I, I think so. I think that would definitely be the ultimate goal in order to bring his brothers to life and give them bodies the same way they had so that they could all like live a life together as it were. Um, so yeah, I think especially Choso without the character development that Yuji and the others brought him wouldn't have thought twice about killing a human in order to give his brother's body. So yeah, totally. And then do you think the other six brothers, if they had incarnated, it would have had any impact on the Shinjuku fight? And no, I don't. I think the best impact they could have had was giving Yuji blood manipulation because Choso, um, Ezu and Kechizu, I might be mispronouncing it, but the three that did incarnate were the special grade level ones. The other six brothers weren't as powerful. So if they would have incarnated, they wouldn't have been on Choso level. So I think we basically got the best of both worlds in, in terms of gaining their strength in the Shinjuku fight via Yuji, as opposed to just six like cannon fodder level curse womb death paintings. And then Solace's second question here is, suppose that Sukuna had just been in his true body and he didn't have to like be an incarnated sorcerer via cursed object with Megami. Would he have won? AKA basically what Uruume says at the end, right? That y'all are lucky you were born a thousand years late and didn't have to fight him in his true form. So yeah, honestly, I think it, I don't know if I would just say for sure they would have lost, but I do think it would have been a lot harder because the fact that the soul punches were like stripping him of his power due to the fact that he was an incarnated sorcerer and it was stripping him of control of that body, they would not have had that benefit if he was in his true body, right? Yuji's soul punches definitely still would have been hurting him, but they wouldn't have been as impactful. Um, and so, yeah, I honestly think that they probably would have lost had that been the case. But also then you got to take into consideration, well, if that had been the case, then he wouldn't have had 10 shadows and maybe wouldn't have ever gotten past Gojo. But if we assume everything else plays out the same where like he still beats Gojo, Gojo by whatever means and then fights everybody else, then I do think he probably would have beaten everybody else. Next up, we got this from Hippity Hop, who is a YouTube member, so shout out to you, King. But they start their comment saying just how much they love Higuruma. And you already know I'm right there with you. One of my favorite little arcs in JJK, and the fact that Gege was able to accomplish that in such little screen time is impressive. But Hippity goes on to say, could you tell me five positive reasons why JJK should end after the coming two chapters? I don't know why people are complaining about the latest chapters and the ending, or why they're trying to guilt trip uh, JJK lovers, uh, but my gut says it's just a great time to wrap up everything. 
And here's what I'll say. I, I don't have like five bullet point reasons on why it should end. I will give you my thoughts on why I do believe it's a good thing that it's ending ultimately. But uh, what I'll say about the people that are complaining and stuff, th there's two groups here, right? And the first group I talked about a little bit earlier when we were talking about my Hikaruma rant, there's obviously the people that are just going to be toxic and negative and yelling into the void. Like when you reach a level of popularity like JJK and you're on the internet, that's just inevitable, right? And and some of those people are some of those people are in good faith, but most of them aren't, right? Now, if we're talking about the people that are in good faith complaining and just saying that, like, you know what, I didn't like this, I wish this had happened, I wish we had gotten a merger arc, et cetera, et cetera, then that's completely valid, right? And there are no objective reasons to say that like they're wrong, because they're not wrong, right? That's just what they would have preferred and what they would have enjoyed more. And I think that's completely fine. So, and I know you're not probably speaking to those types of people. But all of this is just to preface my reasons for why I do think JJK ending is good is just to say that that's just my opinion, right? In a hypothetical scenario where we could have gotten A, B, or C, that might have been great too. But at the end of the day, why I do think it's good is because that's the vision the author has, right? Gege had this story in mind, and he, in his mind, he's reached that logical conclusion point. Now, take all of this with a grain of salt, because for all we know, in two chapters, he'll set up a sequel, and we'll get JJK Part 2. If so, great, right? But assuming the manga does end in two chapters, then that's clearly the story Gege wanted to tell, and if that's the ending point, I trust his vision. He is the master and commander director of this ship, right? So, I mean, I know you guys can think of some TV shows that you love, maybe have a couple of great seasons and then just go downhill uh, because they just wanted to keep printing money and keep the train going instead of having a story in mind that they were trying to serve. And the best shows, the best movies, the best books are that second type, the type where the author knows what they want to do and that's what they see out and then they end, regardless of how successful it is. So assuming JJK is ending, then I love that we're getting that type of story and not just something that's going to keep going because it's popular. Because if that happens, it always goes downhill in quality. So that's why I do think it's a good thing that it's ending because it's ending on Gege's own terms, right? And maybe, you know, extenuating circumstances, we find out he's in terrible health and he was forced to end it, then if so, that sheds light on things and we would maybe have to reassess. But assuming everything else, you know, I do think it's good that it's ending because that's the story he wanted to tell and it's reached its conclusion. Next up, we got this from Twin Cam God, so y'all pause to read it, but it deals with like a potential Kinjaku return. And that's something that, you know, we've talked about for months on the channel. And with two chapters left, I'm less inclined to think it would happen, but I even tweeted after this most recent chapter that like, what if Kinjaku was in Utah right now? So I do think that that like possibility exists, but again, the whole two chapters thing is the thing that's really holding me back on like fully sending it. But I do think it would make sense. Like stuff in the story lines up for that to at least be possible, especially with Kusakabe talking about Kinjaku having used barrier techniques in his brain to separate the curse techniques, right? He probably would have had the nuance to like make himself the brain which we knew uh yuta ate right or rika ate so i think it's at least possible that he could have wormed his way in there but again two chapters left Ugh, i just don't know if we'll see anything like that and then next up, we got a few questions here from Textbook Ninja, and thank you for the kind words, man. Kagurabashi content coming soon. But the first one, he asks about Yuta and this stitches situation. Why does he have the stitches? I'm kind of curious about that too, because we know that the stitches are from a binding vow that Kenjaku made via the fan book with Gege. So we don't know exactly the nuance of that technique. Is there a little literal surgical brain swap or not? It seems to be, but we still don't know for sure. And it doesn't seem as if Yuta would know the binding vow that Kenny did to give the stitches so it might just be that the stitches are there because it's so fresh and they will heal away but Kenjaku's were permanent because of the binding vow but this is something maybe we'll get a little bit of clarification on before the end of the manga but I wouldn't count on it but you know we'll have to see maybe there is some sort of twist we'll still find out. And then Ninja's second question here is about Gojo versus Sukuna, something we've talked about a lot, but let me clarify here because I think there's maybe a slight misunderstanding. I do think Sukuna slightly outmatches Gojo, but that's Sukuna with the Tin Shadows. So Sukuna with Maharaga slightly outmatches Gojo because he won their 1v1. Sukuna by himself versus Gojo by himself, I think is a coin flip that either can win. So whoever you give Maharaga to, I think has the edge. 
And then finally, a hypothetical Sukuna with Maharaga versus Yuta in Gojo's body with Rika would have been incredible. Like, just imagine those panels. That's all for this one, y'all. Thank you all so much for the support, and thank you for watching.